Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Inside D2 Football, along with Justin Polizzi, Tony Nicolette, Matt Witwicky, Jack Bittner, and Chris Ferguson. I am Brandon Meisner. As always, thank you very much for joining us. What do we got going on tonight? Well, it was a heck of a weekend in Division Two. Four matchups of top 25 teams, some results that will impact teams, and some that will impact the Super Region rankings come out tomorrow. Uh, we will review some of those games. Uh, we will look at our stock up, stock down segment, as we always do to uh, judge the trends of some teams. We'll also go, not a deep dive, but a dive into what we think tomorrow's regional rankings uh, could look like. And then we will answer your uh, questions, criticisms of the overtime period after our pick segment. But uh, once again, thank you very much uh, for being with us tonight. Uh, we're going to start tonight with uh, uh, quite a game, uh, an offensive explosion in Warrensburg as Central Missouri uh, comes away with a 77-27 win over Emporia State. And it was, uh, there's no other way to describe it, Chuck, but that it was an offensive explosion. Yeah, I have prioritized to watch this one because we expected it to be kind of a high-flying, high-scoring kind of a game. And it, it certainly looked like after the first quarter, we were set for an epic shootout. It was 28-20 to 20 after one quarter of play. But really, as we got into the second quarter, Central Missouri's defense started to make some stops. And that's really where this game started to change a little bit. Because at one point late in the second half, Central Missouri forced Emporia into three straight three-and-out possessions. And you know, at that point... Central Missouri's offense is still rolling. They started this game with seven straight touchdown drives. And all seven of those drives were no less than 75 yards. So it's not even like they were taking advantage of a short field from a turnover or a big special teams play. They're just marching down the field uh, to open this game. And once the defense started to make those stops, the Mules really started to get some separation. And then it just became too much. Uh, for Emporia to be able to recover from. So uh, let's read through some of the superlatives from this because it truly was amazing. 317 rush yards, 659 passing yards for Central Missouri. Individually, Zach Zabrowski, 615 passing yards, eight touchdowns. That was an MIAA single game record. Marcellus Hawkins, 183 rush yards, three TD. R. Kell Smith, 137 receiving yards, three TD. Zion Perry, 119 receiving yards and a touchdown. Just incredible numbers. It all adds up to 976 total yards, 11 touchdowns, 77 points. And the thing is, this is a good football team they were playing. It's not like they did this against a you know a really bottom tier D2 team or, or somebody that just was a total mismatch. Emporia State is in the top half of the deepest conference in Division II. That was a good football team that Central Missouri did all that too. So... I was just beyond impressed. I don't even know how to make sense of it, but thankfully we have a guest <laughs> who can help us figure out uh, how this went yesterday. That's right. You don't have to make sense of it, Chuck, because hopefully uh, Josh Lamberson, the head coach <laughs> at the University of Central Missouri, uh, can help us with that. Josh, thank you very much for being with us tonight on Inside D2 Football. Guys, really appreciate you having me on. Um, and I know I said this backstage, but really appreciate you guys for advocating for our for our game and our level. Um, it's it's fantastic what you guys do. I know this takes a lot of time and commitment on your part. So for you guys to be um, advocates of the Division II level, I, I think I speak for all coaches and everybody at this level. I, I really appreciate it. Coach, we appreciate the kind words. Um, Looking at your game yesterday, a lot of big numbers to digest, but uh, one that we saw right away, a uh, homecoming crowd of more than 12,000. And uh, tell us a little bit of, a little bit about that atmosphere and kind of what it means for your crew to play in front of that. Well, it, I, I appreciate bringing that up. It, it was a fantastic atmosphere, just just from the, the general um, part of being homecoming here in Warrensburg at UCM. People, they do, they come out and they support their athletics and uh, we've been fortunate enough this year to, to kind of give them some things to cheer for. And as you know, in a, in a football game, the 18 to 23 year olds feed off of, of other people's energy. And uh, with 12,000 people in the building or in the facility yesterday, I, I think it was uh, huge for our guys to be able to feed off of that. Most of them were in red and black and, and they made a lot of noise on third and fourth down and really encouraged our guys and cheered them on um, really from the opening bell. So, Coach, I read through some of the stats and the, uh, the superlatives on the offense, but I'd really like to start with your defense because I, I thought that they really had a huge impact on the way this game played out because I was thinking this could be the kind of game where one or two stops per half 
<laughs> might determine who wins this game. And your defense did a lot more than that. I think nine punts that they forced and two turnovers. So tell us a little bit about how you assessed the defense from yesterday. Yeah, I, I, I thought they did a fantastic job. Um, you know, obviously, Emporia State is is very, very talented on offense, um, and it starts with their quarterback and knew we needed to get pressure on him. One of the things, Chuck, that I, I really thought was an important part of the football game was, you know, we took the football and we were able to go down and score early on our on our very first possession, but they, we forced a punt on the first possession of the game uh, for Emporia, and then our offense went down and scored. So we kind of started with a 14-0 buffer you know, five minutes into the game. And, you know, then they were able to, to kind of come back on that. But but I thought that initial movement in the football game really played dividends. And then, you know, the second half, they were able to come out and, and shut them out the entire second half that, you know, that hasn't really happened to Emporia. And it, that's a credit to our defensive staff and, and Coach Jones for what they did, um, you know, during the halftime adjustments and were able to to really put a lot of pressure on their quarterback and, and uh, by all intents and purposes, um, suffocate that uh, the very talented wide receiving core. You know, you've had a great offense all year long. Going into the game, you know, I, I know you're a confident person. I highly doubt you thought you were going to score 77. So what were the factors that led to the explosion yesterday? <laughs> this is this is this is gonna sound kind of strange uh brandon but it you know we we, we do have good players um and, and i think that and that that One or two. That's a testament to them yeah absolutely but i i would say um a lot of teams have good players and poor state has good players um around the country and what we have been able to do with with our players is empower them and build a culture of of trust and love and relationships that they are allowed to play free and so they're allowed to go out and they're make to make plays but they're also allowed to go out and, and make mistakes and our guys are are not keeping score by the scoreboard, and I, I know that sounds totally counterculture to everything that we do, but that's not the way that they're judging success. Um, they they literally are judging. They, this group loves to be around each other. They love to practice. They love to go out and play uh, in games and the opportunity for Saturday afternoon and pl playing in front of twelve thousand people. That is that's the kind of stuff that you know that they focused on. And our offense yesterday was able to go out and do the things that they do every day in practice. You know, all of those things, all of those plays that we made uh, yesterday were were all byproducts of, of what they do every single day. And so, yes, uh, you know, obviously a confident person, but very, very confident because of my belief in, in what they do in the dark and what they do every day at practice and how they behave and how they prep and how they play. Um, so it wasn't a, a huge surprise for anybody wearing red and black yesterday for what the offense was able to come out and do. So, Coach, I want to get you to talk a little bit more about that, because uh, two weeks ago when we did our first discussion of who the Harlan Hill candidates are, I said that, that midseason Zach Zabrowski is the clear leader. And I was pretty surprised some of my uh, my buddies here on the show thought I was uh, kind of crazy about that. Well, if he wasn't oh. the leader, then he sure is now. So, I mean, obviously, we can see the stats. We can see the production. But tell us a little bit more about who he is as a player, the leadership he brings to the team and uh, what he brings to, to the offense. Yeah, and, and thanks for bringing that up, Chuck. And, you know, he we, we have a mule of the week, um, and it's it's our guy that best represents everything that is good about UCM football and, and our football tribe. And that it has nothing to do with stats. It has nothing to do with uh, performances, you know, in between the stripes. And, and Zach actually won that this week. It just so coincided with his record-breaking performances for what he did on Saturday. But it all goes back to, to Zach's competitiveness, uh, his leadership, the way that he interacts with his teammates, the trust that he has built with his teammates, the way that he hangs out with those guys and treats those guys outside of the stripes. Um, I think one of the things that Zach's work ethic, uh, he's been around the game his entire life. His dad's a football coach. There's never been a moment that has seemed heavy for Zach. Um, he legitimately loves to play the game of football. Uh, and he doesn't, he's not afraid of making mistakes. He, he, he embodies our free, fast, physical, and fun mode and, and is one of the most competitive humans that I've ever been around, but not so competitive that he gets lost up in the moment and, and gets tense and tight. Um, Zach, I think the bigger the moment, uh, the more free he gets. And I think that's that's a contagious thing to the rest of our football team. I think they feed off of that confidence. They feed off that um, attitude that, that he brings to our football program. And and one that I think if you watch our offense, it, it really um, – permeates throughout everybody that's playing on that side of the ball and then our defense as well coach uh last year in your first year at the helm for the mules you guys went four and seven uh now this season you guys are seven and one with your only setback a tight loss against pitt state who's ranked what third nationally mm -hmm. in our poll 
Uh, you know, looking back at it, you know, may, maybe uh, two months from now, when you look at this season, what do you think are going to be the biggest reasons for this upswing? I, I think it's all about the relationships. It's all about the culture. It's all about our player empowerment. Um, you know, when, when I got hired last year, you know, it was late February and came into a situation where I, I don't think there was adequate time for, for me to get to know the staff and the players to get to know me. And there wasn't a lot of trust and, and there, there wasn't a foundation of, of relationship there. And I think, I think that just takes time um, and it takes investment in people. And I think that's one of the biggest shifts that we have made. We've, we've had enough time to, to get to know each other. Uh, we've had enough time to, to build that trust. We've had enough time to invest in each other's lives that what we say is not just words that are floating out in the universe, but they're things that we're going to back up um, and that we genuinely care about the individuals in our program. And I know that gets said a lot around the country, but it, but it really is true here. And I think that's the biggest uptick for what we've been able to do is, is invest in each other, um, whether it's a coach to coach or player to player, or player to coach relationship that we have. It's really been everybody in our program that's bought into that. Um, and I think, you know, obviously the success is a byproduct of that. I, I truly believe that is the culture that we've been able to build here and, and the trust and relationships and love that are, that are going on. Josh, I kind of want to piggyback on that for a moment because we've talked about some of your players and your culture and, and that sort of thing and the, and the relationship you have with each other. You have, uh, you know, a handful of new players this year. I, yeah. I'm interested in how did you find them? You know, and because I know it can be a, a thousand different ways. And then how do you get them to buy in so quickly? Or how do you find the person that's the right? Thing? Yeah, and uh, this is going to be a different answer, uh, to be real honest with you. And so when when we were in the off season, you know, the staff and, and all of us, we we prayed for God to send us the people that needed us. And that that was that was one from you, you don't ever know uh, exactly what that's going to do and, and who's going to wind up at your front door and you know, it, it was it was a lot of hard work and it was a lot of deciphering through names and it was a lot of phone calls and it was a lot of text messages and all the things that that happened with that. But I but I truly believe what has been set forth here is is not it's not from us. Um, you know, I'm just a byproduct of, of all of it. And I've been blessed that I get to sit in, in the front of the bus and um, have been blessed with a phenomenal platform. But it's uh, it's been through a lot of hard work and a lot of prayer uh, through my myself and our staff. Uh, to be able to find these guys and for these guys to be able to find us. Um, I think it's a, it's a two way street in recruiting. And um, I think we have been able to find the right type of people that had some skill that had some ability that maybe weren't utilized um, properly in their own mind, or maybe weren't just in the right mindset to be able to be, to, to be able to, to use their skill set uh, where they were at, at that point in time. And I think, um, you know, with our, with our relationships that we've had with our young men in our program, I think that it enables them to, to truly believe in themselves. Uh, and it, again, not the fake superficial stuff, uh, but the inner belief that, that they can go out and do some really special things on a, on a Saturday and, and enjoy the process of doing it. All right, Josh got one final question for you. And this one's about you. Uh, it, you know, we're not, we're not telling any secrets here that things didn't go very well uh, when you were at Nebraska Kearney, obviously things are going well. Now, yeah. how are you different? How are things different from then to now? Well, I think I'm a lot different from the standpoint of, you know, when I was when I first got the opportunity to to be the head coach at the University of Nebraska Kearney, extremely blessed for Dr. Plinsky, uh, Dr. Paul Plinsky to give me that opportunity at that point in time in my life. But I, I think that my ego got in the way, um, you know, to be totally honest with you, I thought I was probably a lot more important than what I actually was. I, I, I micromanaged, I, I hired people and then didn't let them do the job that I hired them to do because I, I thought that I, I knew a lot more than I actually did. Um, and, and unfortunately in, in life, sometimes you, you have to, you have to learn that hard lesson. And, um, you know, I, I made some decisions there that, that weren't the best decisions and whether it was hiring, whether it was recruiting, um, you know, the, the whole facet. And I, I really own those things, uh, from a standpoint is I, I did not do a very good job. Uh, at that, at, at the University of Nebraska Kearney at that point in time in my life and had to learn some things, had to go and, and talk to my mentors and my role models. And, um, you know, learned a lot from coach Adam Doral with my time uh, with him at Abilene Christian University and, you know, just prayed for another opportunity. I didn't know when that was going to come, um, you know, and extremely blessed and fortunate to, to have this opportunity here at the University of Central Missouri. 
Very good. Well, Josh, it's been a pleasure having you with us here tonight. Wish you the best of luck next week and for the rest of the season. Awesome. I really appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Coach. All right, All right Very guys. Good. Have a great night. All right, that's Josh Lamerson, the head coach at the University of Central Missouri. Uh, let's bring the rest of our crew back on. And, Chuck, we will not isolate you in that manner the rest of the show. Uh, but we will talk about – can we find uh, another first... way to isolate him or not? <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, wait, let's talk about uh, first and tenders. We've talked about uh, Boss's Pizza a lot, but instead let's talk about uh, first and tenders. Uh, we mentioned them last week on the show. Tell us about them again. Yeah, well, I, I had them since our last show. Well, How's that give, sound? Give us a report then. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, like when you get those tenders where they get all like the – the crunchy stuff is like overdone in it, and it's kind of not a good experience. This is yeah. exactly the opposite of that. This is very meaty, and uh, I would absolutely do that again. And I had spicy barbecue, which um, would definitely was spicy barbecue. Um, <laughs> That's I, 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 important. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, <laughs> no, sometimes I get spicy barbecue. It doesn't have much zip to it, Brandon. This had, uh, like, second bite. I was, you know, kind of roof of my mouth a little hot so okay but uh all good with it and i would do it again yeah, very good so, well again uh you know we've mentioned uh, several times you can go to boss's pizza and chicken first and tenders are different go to first and tenders.com uh to to check that out uh they're ghost kitchen uh maybe that would be an opportunity for somebody locally to to run that out of their out of their house but uh not their house their yes i was doing running the ghost kitchen earlier today yes <laughs> all right uh but on your screen, you see a mobile version of uh, Boss's Pizza and Chicken. They're looking for franchisees around the Midwest. Go to the upper right-hand corner if you uh, are interested in that. And, of course, uh, if you go there, tell them you heard about them from us because uh, they're, they're a supporter of us, and we want to support them, and uh, we really appreciate what they've done for us. All right, folks, let's move on, and let's look at uh, things that happened around the top 25. It was kind of a topsy-turvy Day, lots of results, as you'll find out in the pick'em, that we did not predict accurately that things happened uh, that we did not think would. And the first one that happened that was a surprise to all of us, or the first outcome that was a surprise, was Minnesota State. Thought they'd go into Augustana and, and, and come away with a victory. Instead, Augustana dominates 28-10, to 10, uh, a win for uh, the Vikings. Pretty impressive win, Whit. Yeah, pretty much exactly what I expected. You know, they were just going to shut down the Mankato running game. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, <laughs> kind of kind of a shock with that. But, uh, yeah, I was in attendance there, so you probably see my big butt any moment here. We're going to, yes. Uh, there you yeah, go. I'm, I'm in the background here on this score to Epperson on a fourth down play where Mankato blitzes and uh, Augie makes him pay. We got to 14-3 to three at this point. And uh, Mankato trying to run the football with Sheen Butler Lawson. This was a story of the day. He couldn't get going for a third straight game under 100 yards. He didn't even have 50 in this one, I believe. And Augie just did a tremendous job against the run, and Epperson gets loose again uh, for the score. Mankato kind of lost track of him a few times in this game. He had a 85-yard touchdown run. Uh, then we, we've got Lampkin for the score. And Augustana, uh, really impressive game. I would say, Brandon, that that was the most impressive win under Coach OJ there, uh, period. And he's been there since uh, 2013, uh, which is now a long time. And uh, they I've never seen their defense play that well at home, uh, you know, under in, in his tenure. And it just really was a shocking outcome. And uh, it's the Vikings are going to make a jump in, in the top 25 as a result of it, I'm guessing. No doubt. I have no doubt about that. So it obviously helps them uh, the rest of the way in a tough Super Region 4 yeah. in terms of the regional rankings. So let's move on to Super Region 2, where you'll see in the pick'em results, uh, Delta State. We <laughs> thought they would beat West Florida. West Florida thought, you guys are fools. And they uh, went into Delta, won 24-21. Tell us about it, Justin. Tell us about it, not on mute. <laughs> 
<laughs> there we go. There we go. But no, it it's, is the game we all pick. We all pick Delta State, right? And yeah, yeah, brother. If you're gonna if you're gonna talk on mute, you're gonna have to shout a lot louder than you did. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry, yeah, about you're that. good. You're good. You can hear me now, right? No. Yeah. Um, yes. What? I thought y'all could hear me. I thought I thought it didn't matter. I'm loud anyway. But uh, no, guys, this is a game that you know we all picked. We all picked Delta State, and uh, when when we thought about this game to begin with, I think we thought a lot of fireworks, a lot of offense was going to happen. And that really wasn't the case. It really became, to me, the story of the defenses. Um, I thought, you know, West Florida scores 14 unanswered in the second half to win 24-21. Delta State had a had a 21-10 lead at the half, uh, and it, they just never got anything going. West Florida made some great adjustments at halftime, and their defense stepped up. Patrick Shegog ended up 13 uh, for 31, I believe. 13 of 33, I'm sorry, for 186. Um, and, and just didn't really seem to get in a rhythm, particularly in the second half, and and just seemed like West Florida could do everything, you know, got everything rolling, and, and Delta State just didn't. They just they couldn't get it going when they had the opportunity to. Um, and and again, I when, when you look at this game, there was a lot of penalties. There was 22 penalties for over 200 yards of penalty yardage. Uh, it was pretty sloppy in that, but uh, overall, and and the other the other thing that really got me was the, the time of possession. Uh, West Florida held the ball for just over 40 minutes of, of game wow. action. So wow. yeah, that, that's, that, that was a little surprising, but uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, West Florida proved that, you know, it was, you know, maybe it was just a fluke and, uh, and, uh, but 24, uh, 21, the Argos with the win. Right. Now this game was, a, was a toss up game. We all thought uh, the next one we're going to talk about that is UT Permian Basin goes into Angelo and, uh, or San Angelo and wins 28, 28- 23 but uh, it's a pretty good game Ferg. yeah i agree and uh it, it was kind of hard to to really see if uh premium basin was up for the challenge and they certainly were um but early on it, it was more so angelo who had gotten up to a 10 point lead twice uh it, it, as they went through the first half and it took really the third quarter uh for for uh premium basin to finally flex their their will a little bit and outscoring Angelo 14 to three, uh, uh, really close that score. They didn't score in the fourth quarter. And, 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 it, and even though Angelo had opportunities, the uh, premium bases defense stepped up for two interceptions uh, uh, to sort of salt away the game, you know, kind of what mentioned what uh, 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 Justin mentioned about time possession. Uh, I think premium basin took the same uh, style of play uh, that West Florida did. They actually had the ball for, uh, a little over 35 minutes to kind of keep uh, Angelo's offense off the field. Uh, and then, you know, lastly, I do want to point out uh, Kenny Hernzer, uh had all was uh, accounted for all four uh, touchdowns in, in this game. You know, kind of a, a underrated quarterback in, in uh, at the Division II ranks. All right, Chris, we'll oh. stay with you and talk about one more game. Uh, in my opinion, and tell me if I'm wrong, a shocking outcome – Elizabeth City with a 17-16 win over Virginia State. Yeah, you know, and I had kind of heard something um, uh, earlier this week that, uh, you know, this could act, this outcome could actually happen. And I just said, what What do I look like in my column if I picked a one-win Elizabeth City team, City team to win over a undefeated Virginia State? I just, like, I just could not do that to myself. And clearly I was wrong. But you know what? What was really interesting here, uh, Elizabeth City is a team that, you know, despite uh, now only winning two games of the season, they've had numerous close losses, uh, you know, well within one score. I think like three or four games where they lost by one score. So they're certainly coming up uh, despite the record. And and Virginia State really, I think, slept walk through this game and and they paid a price, especially at the very end when they could have tied the game and they missed an extra point. And, and, and in recent years, that has been an issue for Virginia State, where they have games that have that are winnable, and then they just can't get through their kicking woes, and it bit them again uh, this year. Well, uh, nonetheless, it's probably going to knock them out of the top 25 uh, to when the poll comes out tomorrow. Uh, let's look at some other news and notes. Uh, running back Sidney Gibbs became Shaw's all-time career rushing yards holder on Saturday. Uh, post earned their first win in program history, a uh, 16 to 13 win over Franklin Pierce. Uh, they started football last year and they had not won in their first 16 games. Congratulations to them. Uh, 
Harding, known for rushing, and they uh, certainly backed that up yesterday. 631 yards and a win over Southern Arkansas. It's the second highest total in program history. Uh, Braden Jay had 202, and Blake De La Cruz had 201. So two backs with 200. And uh, everybody is uh, reminding us today to talk about Tyson Bajant. He did win his start for the Bears. So uh, congratulations to him to win uh, his first start as an NFL, in his first start as an NFL quarterback, yeah. especially for what's really not a very good team. So that's uh, pretty impressive by Tyson. We want to congratulate him on that. Uh, more to come on Inside D2 Football. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and D2Football.com and Inside D2 Football are teaming up with the Pink Clover Foundation. This 501c3 nonprofit foundation was formed by family and friends after the passing of Colleen Sorbello in 2017. While she was fighting breast cancer for four years, she participated in many trials and was passionate about finding a way to make the treatment less harsh for women fighting breast cancer. Pink Clover's mission is to raise money for breast cancer research, provide free breast cancer education seminars, and closest to their hearts, provide comfort for women who are struggling while battling breast cancer. Since 2018, Pink Clover has raised over $670,000, providing direct assistance to women affected by breast cancer. They have also partnered with three hospitals and raised money for research, including the University of New Haven's Breast Cancer Research Laboratory. To see how you can help, visit pinkcloverfoundation.org or visit their Facebook or Instagram pages by searching Pink Clover Foundation. All right, very good. It's time now to look at our stock up, stock down teams. Uh, four of them this week. Let's start with the stock up, and it will we'll start with St. Anselm. Chuck, uh, tell us why they deserve to, be, uh, to have that green arrow pointing upward. Well, I wasn't sure I wanted to uh, talk about St. Anselm on the stock up, stock down, because we talk about him all the time on this show. But um, <laughs> huge, huge congrats to St. Anselm for where they are at right now. Though They did not do well out of conference, lost the first two games of the season, did not look like they were set up for a good season at all. Since then, they have gone five and one. Their only loss is a, on a kind of a bad day against a Southern Connecticut State. But they are currently leading the Northeast 10 standings, which for those of us who've been around for a while, the thought of St. Anselm winning the Northeast 10 Conference Championship is just mind-blowing. Um, personally, I'd love to see it happen. Uh, they've been working really hard to improve the program there. Just look at the last three weeks, guys. The big three in the Northeast 10 are the teams that we generally believe are the ones that could be in play for the championship. Bentley, New Haven, and Assumption. In the last three weeks, San Anselm has beaten all three of those teams, wow. uh, which is just really, really impressive for them uh, to be playing at that level. And, and uh, one at Assumption, it was a really kind of sloppy day with the weather, tough conditions, down a couple players, and they gritted out a, a shutout win at Assumption. So I'm, I'm just pleased to see what's going on there with the Hawks and the beautiful campus up there in New Hampshire and a uh, huge stock up for San Anselm football. Fun to be able to talk about. Uh, a team that's probably not going to be happy that we're talking about him in this manner. North Greenville, Stockdale. Yeah, guys, after starting two and one, uh, they've lost uh, four of their last five. And, and right now the Crusaders are only averaging about 19 points a game on offense, uh, giving up about 28 a game. So right now they're they're a little bit on the struggle bus. But uh, this week they have Mississippi College and they finish up with shorter. So a couple games that are within reach for them. But but right now they're they're on that downward trend, looking to break it here, losing the last four to five. Okay, uh, Chris Edward Waters heading in the right direction. You know, it's another team that we don't talk about very much on this show, and uh, you know, formerly known as uh, everybody's homecoming opponent. Uh, yeah, Edward Waters has made some teams pay this year uh, for uh, being the homecoming opponent. Just ask Tuskegee. What happened <laughs> after uh, Saturday before uh, last? So, uh, well, video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 30,000 30, people saw that one. Oh, brutal. Just brutal. Uh, you know, uh, Elwaters Waters uh, on a five-game win streak, they've beaten some Blue Bloods in the SIC uh, with Tuskegee and this week against Albany State, both at the very end of the game. Uh, just to show you how competitive they are, uh, their quarterback, Jiren Russell, uh, actually has improved his game. Now has passed for over 2,000 yards this season. 
a uh, huge improvement from from last year. Uh, and then also they they lost to um, uh, uh, Fort Valley State by three, uh, and that just shows you how competitive they have been at the top half of the SIC. Awesome. Uh, one last one, stock down, Concord. Tell us about that. Yeah, you know, looking last year, we thought that this this was a squad that they were right on the brink of making the playoffs. Uh, you know, nine and two record. And then preseason, we were going ahead and doing, you know, picks for for who was going to win their conference, uh, you know, and we're looking through all this. And all of a sudden, weeks later with, you know, Jack Mangle, good quarterback, still there for him and everything, they find themselves 0-8. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, it's this is maybe one of the biggest surprises nationally that, you know, a team being quite this down. Right. So, um you know, this season's lost, obviously, at this point, uh, just a matter of kind of uh, how they rebound, uh, you know, going into next year at that point. All right. Cool. Very good. Well, guess what, folks? When we come back, we will preview tomorrow's regional ranking. Just wanted to. October. Just wanted to take this opportunity to thank those who have supported D2 football this year. D2 football is free, but it isn't cheap. Your support helps offset our expenses and allows us to expand our coverage. If you like what we're doing, please consider supporting us. Visit d2football.com support. Or if you want to do it the old fashioned way, click contact on the website to find our mailing address. But again, thank you for supporting D2 football. Fantastic. Welcome back. Uh, as we talked about a couple times tomorrow, uh, will be the first regional rankings that are released with the caveat with there'll be an alphabetical order tomorrow, correct? Right. Uh, tomorrow, what we're going to be looking at is basically a, a shot of 10 and for each super region, but they're going to have an alphabetical order because apparently the NCAA is fearful that everyone will lose their minds <laughs> if there's actually rankings attached to all that stuff like the past. Well, let's go ahead and look at uh, each one of them. I, I had lots of things to say, but I don't want to do a couple of YouTube. I was teeing you up there, B. I was teeing you up. Huh. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> we'll start my rant early in the show today. Uh, let's go ahead and look at Super Region 1, bringing up uh, the, the numbers as computed by our friend Inkblot. Uh, looking at Super Region 1, they're sorted by uh, the wins, uh, win loss, and the strength of schedule. Uh, that's the sort that we're doing there. Uh, Chuck, what are your thoughts on Super Region 1? Well, you know, since we we are just going to get a list of 10 teams in no particular order, I don't really expect any surprises. I think if you kind of look at the way these are ordered, 1 through 10, that's pretty much what I would expect to see when this list comes out. Um, if they were ranking 1 to 10, we'd probably have a lot more to discuss, debate, and, and nitpick who belongs in what positions. But since we're really just getting a list of 10 teams, I think this is a pretty good snapshot of what you're going to look at. I think some of the things that are interesting to think about for the future, one, uh, we still have a lot of games to be played among the teams that you're seeing just in this snapshot here, um, so including some coming up this weekend. Frostburg State and Charleston have a big meeting that's coming up. Uh, Shepard and East Stroudsburg still have to play. Uh, Tiffin's got some tough games coming up. Slipper Rock is going to have most likely the conference championship coming up in the, in the PSAC. So there's still so many critical games to be played that are going to impact all this. And the one that I think is kind of interesting to keep an eye on is Finley. Is Finley's well down the order right now. The SOS is low. Um, they're, they're probably landing around 12th to 13th right now. Finley's got a lot of important games coming up. And if they can win out, um, I will be very interested to see how high the Oilers might be able to jump. So definitely still a lot to keep an eye on, but I think for Monday, I'm not expecting any drama with this list. All right, let's go ahead and move to Super Region 2. And Chris, tell me your thoughts on what you see there. Well, I mean, I think it's uncharacteristic to see. Uh, uh, it was very characteristic to see the, the undefeated teams at the top here. You know, after that, what we started to see is a, a number of conferences start to beat up on each other. Uh, especially after the, the result that happened yesterday with Delta falling from the ranks of the unbeaten. Uh, particularly interesting, uh, Tuskegee, you know, that's they're going to the Turkey Day Classic, so uh, not really going to be in the hunt for a playoff spot. 
which you can move those folks up. Uh, Virginia Union and Virginia State meet in Week 10. Uh, Van Osta uh, back on uh, the playoff hunt after what happened last year, but they've got to play the, the, the Gang of West. Uh, West Florida, <laughs> West Georgia, and West Alabama, and that is a uh, pretty tough uh, gauntlet uh, uh, to get through, uh, starting with uh, West Florida uh, this week. And, you know, Lenore Ryan's got Wingate uh, seem to be surging up uh, and the SAC championship game, and, and, and even Benedict, you know, that they, they may be facing a potential rematch with somebody like a Miles. Um, so there's just so much uh, to sort of work through uh, mm-hmm. In this particular um, matchup, also of note, uh, Ella Waters, um, provisional member uh, in Division Two, not they don't they do not uh, qualify for the playoffs uh, this season. Yeah. Glad you said something. I didn't know what that little I meant there, and I assume yeah. that's yeah, what the discussion is. There, there's a few of those around the country. So from two to three, Brandon, uh, this is kind of your home region. Uh, very, very deep field and we're already kind of looking at the prospect of anybody with two losses is pretty much already out tell us what you're seeing that's exactly what i'm saying i don't think there's any doubt about that unless there's just a major collapse at the top of every conference um but there it looks like eight teams are fighting for seven positions um pittsburgh state's going to be in a good position if they can win out uh, because they will have played sioux falls and they'll do that this week uh, rather than Lincoln, who had been part of the MIAA schedule. Pitt State strength of schedule, because of that, will finish above 500. That's going to give them um, a little bump, especially if it's a head-to-head with Harding at the end of the year, because we know Harding is going to be uh, – we expect them to be 11-0, uh, but we know the strength of schedule is going to be 500. Uh, I expect Indianapolis to win out. I expect Grand Valley to win out. Truman to win out. I expect Missouri to win out. A Davenport um, – I was not impressed with their win this weekend at Mary. Um, and I, I was good. I was thinking that, you know, they would finish with two losses. I don't think it's inconceivable that they won't have three. Uh, and then, so you got Ferris there. Also, you know, the, the giant of the, uh, the region right now, looming with one loss. It'll be interesting to see where they end up. And that theoretically could be another, another super region because of the geography. We're not going to go down that road yet. And then Washita Baptist. So, who will be the two teams or three teams at the end with one loss fighting for that last posi- uh, position? That's what's going to be interesting to me. But uh, uh, that, that those are my thoughts on Super Region Three. Let's go ahead and look at four. And uh, Matt, what are your thoughts on Super Region Four? Yeah, when you first arrive here, Brandon, you notice that you know you got two RMAC teams right at the top. Uh, For those who haven't given this a look previous to this point, that may be a little bit surprising. Uh, Both have played, you know, good out of conference, and so their SOS is strong, along with being unbeaten. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then from there, uh, some of the other things that you're going to notice, as I move down the page right now, Angelo's on the 10 line. Uh, I would expect that they'll probably be on that, you know, in that grouping tomorrow as well. Um, Their strength of schedule at 631 is really high in this listing here. Mm -hmm. Now, the natural thought was that they got their third loss, you know, last night and they're probably out of the mix. I still think they probably are, but I'm not going to count them out entirely. Um, in the event a three loss team were to be getting a, getting a little bit of love, they might be that one. Um, otherwise, I really think that if we take a look up to a bot Bemidji and Duluth, those eight teams are really the grouping that you're going to have as playoff teams and one of them isn't going to make it and Bemidji and Duluth play this weekend. So that's going to help kind of sort things out a little bit in my opinion. Yeah. Playoffs start early for lots of teams this year. You know, when it's, when, when the, the one loss scenarios in three and four uh, are making this a very interesting end to the regular season. All Brandon, right, while folks. you transition, Brandon, yeah, while you transition next thing, I, I do just want to mention because I, I appreciate that every year we have people who are kind of getting exposed to this process to the fir- for the first time. And it is complex, the selection process and how it all works. It's complicated. There's a lot that goes into it. And you'll have to forgive us if we don't want to rehash every detail of it every week when we do this show. So I just want to mention, we do have some resources that can help you if you are new yep. to this or if you've seen it for the first time. Um, I have a column that I kind of rehash every year and, and update with all the details of you know, how this works, what goes into it. Um, we actually have a pre-recorded segment we did two years ago that runs through all this. So 
I'll be posting that on d2football.com tomorrow, and we'll tweet it out. So if you're confused by some of the stuff that we said, um, don't worry. We'll take care of you. Right. Chuck will. Chuck will take care of you. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck was volunteering work for everybody else. I like it. So, yeah. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and transition uh, to. Let's the not. Uh, can we skip it? Have we ever Ooh. skipped it because we were so embarrassed by it? I, I only had two wins last week. I'm right. I'm right at that part. Yeah, it, it, it was. Uh, it it was not good. Let's go ahead and switch back to the ball view and bring up our pick'em results. Ooh, lots of red, folks. Uh, all right, it's. Um, I, I don't think it's embarrassing, but you know, you, you hate seeing so much red, but at the same time. Isn't it fun that those upsets happen? Because yeah. you know, otherwise, if it's just chalk mm-hmm. all the time, what are we doing here? Sure. You know, so I, 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 I think I think that's fun. You know, and of two course, thirds you know, went three and two, so we were still up. But, yeah. You know, Tony, you can just keep your. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Kirk didn't say anything. I, I just I just want to mention one thing here. Yes. Every please. time. There is unanimous. It's it's almost like the kiss of death. Yeah, yes. yeah. And, and somebody has to take the the plunge and choose the upset and take one for the team this year, <laughs> this this week. For the, for the, for the actual team is what. Yes. In this instance, yes. All right. Uh, so we weren't that proud of them, but again, it made for a fun day, and uh, competition competition's fun. Let's go ahead and 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 look at the ones to watch this week. Uh, Central Washington uh, is going to play at, at Texas A&M Kingsville. Uh, you know, we, we've been critical of Central Washington, but I thought they played pretty well yesterday. You know, and watching them in their game yesterday, they've had a change at quarterback, and um, they were able to go ahead and do a little more zone read stuff. And, you know, basically, they, they kind of look like uh, almost like Wachita in that they're really – run heavy and strong defense. And uh, I thought last night was one of their better moments of the season, frankly. And uh, I think with the change of quarterback and some of the turnovers they've had at that position in the past, that could be a big thing for them. Uh, you know, if they were to get some more stability in that role. And we'll stay with you. Uh, Sioux Falls playing at Pittsburgh state, Jim Glogowski in year one at Sioux Falls, proving he's either crazy or brave <laughs> And not afraid to go on the road to play the gorillas. Yeah, you know, I gave him a hard time about schedule in this game. I said, you, you sure you know you know what you're in for here? And um, you know, they Sioux Falls has been young. They've they've continued to get really dinged up, and he's going through a tough uh, a tough stretch here with this new uh, this new Cougar team. Um, we really thought that this was going to be a better game when it was scheduled way back when. Hasn't quite turned out that way. Um, it's an interesting non-con game. Uh, for all the reasons we love non-con games like this, but uh, obviously Pitt State's a big favorite. Certainly, it'll be more. It'll be. It would be a much more interesting non-conference game in two years than it, yes. than it is right now. So, uh, a conference game though. Uh, Lenore Ryan seven and zero at Wingate five and three. Uh, can can t- Justin can Wingate rally the troops and pull off an upset in this one? You know, I, I've been impressed with Wingate here the last couple of weeks. They've gotten a lot better since I saw them play week two. So um, their defense is, is solid. The offense is coming along. I, I don't think it's uh, it's just going to be a rollover for Lenore Ryan. I think it's gonna, they're going to have to fight and, and scrape this one out if they want to keep that perfect record intact. Um, I think Lenore Ryan might be um, – I mean, they've got it rolling right now. They went to they went to Newberry, a tough place to play. They did a great job down there. It did what they were supposed to do, and, and now you go to Wingate, and this is another game in in the schedule that you looked at, and you said this is this is going to be a challenge. And if you want to be the best, these are the games that you have to go through and you have to win. So uh, the challenge is there for Lenore Ryan, and like I said, Wingate they're they're trending in the right direction right now. I, I've seen some really good things out of them the last couple of weeks, and they're much better than earlier in the year. So this one should be a pretty good one, guys. Right. Hey, Tony, I want to talk to you about this because earlier in the year, I feel like we'd kind of written off Saginaw Valley and they're, they battled back their four and four uh, Davenport seven and oh, I, I'd kind of mentioned that, you know, maybe right. Davenport would pick up a loss that, uh, you know, I hadn't planned. I, I thought they would lose to Ferris and Grand Valley in the year. Is there a chance that Saginaw can pull this one off this, uh, this week or am I just dreaming? 
Uh, there's always a chance, Brandon, but I mean, I don't know, man. I I, I share with sentiment that uh, Davenport's win uh, the, yesterday at Mary wasn't necessarily the uh, the convincing one that maybe we all might have expected. Uh, at the same time, you know, Saginaw Valley yesterday, <laughs> you know, Wayne was without their starting quarterback. Their number two guy who's played a lot this year didn't throw a pass. Wayne possessed that game, the ball in that game for 42 minutes and outgained Saginaw Valley, and yet Saginaw somehow find a way to scrap together a win. Now, with that said, if it's if against Wayne State, you're only putting up 190-some-odd yards of offense, I don't know how you're going to go to Davenport and beat a team that's as balanced as they are and has the, the weapons that they do because uh, Wayne State, you can't accuse them of having those same those same weapons available to them. So I can Saginaw win that game? Sure. Uh, based on what I'm seeing so far over the last handful of weeks out of them, I, I would I don't know that I'd pick them. It's, you can tell me I'm wrong. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> let's let's look at the last game of the week. Um, last game of the ones to watch. When this game was chosen, the thought process would be that Augustana would be seven and one, and Wayne State would be six and two. Obviously, neither one of those things happened. Uh, it's now an Eight no Augustana at Wayne State, but maybe unlike the Gleag game that we just talked about, Wit Wayne State still poses a threat to Augustana, don't they? Yeah, I mean, I think this is no different than if, like, in the MIAA, if you took a look at an Emporia who has fallen a little bit recently, maybe that's your Wayne State, uh, you know, against a pit or something like that. Um, I, you know, I expect Wayne State to come in there and look to rebound. They lost yesterday after being up 19 0 against Northern State. Um, they, they had a tough go of it. Nick Bowen, their quarterback, uh, had four interceptions, very unlike him. Two of them right. went for pick sixes. Uh, instrumental in, in them losing by two points. So I I would expect this is going to be a darn good game. Obviously, Augie's the clear favorite based on record and everything else. Just don't be surprised if this is a real good game. Very good. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and move then to the pick em for this week. What do we got? Frostburg State at Charleston. Assumption at New Haven. Valdosta State at West Florida. Bemidji State at Minnesota Duluth, and Western Colorado is at Colorado Mines. Wow, what a good game. Uh, let's start with our first game, Frostburg State at Charleston. Tony, you're at the top. You get to pick first. Well, I'm going to stay with true to my uh, my MEC conference pick, uh, champion pick from the beginning of the year, so uh, give, me the, give me Frosty. Okay. And, and I'm still, the jury's out on whether I would go pumpkin spice or chocolate on that Frosty, by the way. <laughs> All right. I will go with Frostburg as well. And since I am a man, I would have coffee. For All right. Chuck, please go next. Oh, I already, met. already trending here towards Frostburg. I, I kind of thought maybe I might be one of the only ones to go that direction. Um, I'm Congratulations go on your win this week, Charles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I, can see one, I can see this one going either, either way for sure. Um, I'm going to go Frostburg State. I think their defense makes a difference here. Um, Charleston really just kind of struggled for consistency at Fairmont State on Saturday. Um, made a lot of costly mistakes turning the ball over. And Frostburg is just the kind of team that can force those similar mistakes. Um, also, small factor here, Frostburg played on Thursday night this past week, so a couple right. extra days to prepare for this and rest up. So I'm going to go with Bobcats. Okay. Uh, Whit, what do you got? Well, since I was 2-3 and three this last week in the pick em, I thought I might need a little bit of a pick-me-up. And so now, oh, since no, the Bears won, look out. Charleston didn't have their best performance yesterday. They're going to show everybody they're the class of the league. Go get them, Charleston. All right. And Ferd. You know, I was um, – this is such a toss-up, I agree. Um, and, and Frosty does have a good pick defense. Me. But at the same time, I just have to wonder, you know, if Charleston has a bad game like that and they only lose by three against one of the, the top end on the MVC and they can correct those mistakes that, you know, I, I think that they can take this game. And so I'm liking Charleston to learn from their mistakes 
Totally. And, 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 uh, <laughs> and bounce back this week. Fantastic. All right. Justin, you are the last for this game. Yeah, this one I, I could see going either way. I think the decision maker for me in this one is uh, the defensive backs coach at Charleston is Stephen Palmer. He played for me uh, a couple years ago. So for that, I'm taking Charleston. Oh, I, don't, I didn't like whether you went with that. Uh, kind of hoping you can go down the team. It's, it's, it's okay. the way it is. All right. It, uh, it is what <laughs> that's right. Next game. Uh, assumption at New Haven. I'm going to pick first, and I'm going to pick the Chargers to win. At home, and Chuck, you are next. Um, Assumption's pretty banged up right now. Um, they have a lot of starters that are out. It definitely impacted them this past week, including losing their quarterback uh, for the rest of the season. He didn't play last week. Not expected to return. Um, and New Haven actually had this past week off, so with that extra week to rest up and prepare, I, I just think this really points towards New Haven winning this one. Okay, uh, Matt. I gave this game a hard look, and I was having a hard time finding something to grab onto. And so um, that said, I'm, 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 I guess I'm by I'm more on New Haven because I'm less on Assumption. So we'll take New Haven here. Okay, uh, Chris. I'm going with New ha- New Haven as well. Okay, Justin. New Haven's defense is only giving up twelve and a half points a game. I'm going to take New Haven in this one. I like it. Tony, by any chance, would you like to pick assumptions so that we know that you <laughs> have <laughs> Guys, I, I, Chuck took the words right out of my mouth. Assumption is banged up. Both of them had uh, really ugly games against St. Anselm consecutively, but New Haven's had the extra week to kind of get stuff right. So, I mean, they're at home. In, in addition to all that, it's hard for me to pick against uh, the Chargers there. Fair enough. Well, congratulations <laughs> right. Assumption right. on your upcoming win. All right. <laughs> Let's go with uh, Valdosta State at West Florida. Chuck, you can kick it off for us. This is interesting because in the last two weeks, West Florida has played their best game and their worst game. Yeah. So right. what, what, what are we going to see <laughs> this week? Um, and, you know, I think the, the beating Valdosta State is a fairly – I shouldn't say it quite this way, but to beat Valdosta State, you have to have a strong running game. And West Florida is capable, but it's not really their game. And I think that gives Valdosta State a chance to play with them. And I just really like what the, Blair, the Blazers are able to do offensively. I think they're very underrated at 7-1. and one. Um, I hope they're back in the top 25 this week. I think they should be. Um, this is going to be a bit of an upset, but I'm going to go Valdosta State. All right. Um, Matt. Well, Chuck, you just stole all my – took all the thunder away. Uh, West Florida, I'm not convinced this offense is up to their standard. And uh, defensively, I think that they're better than they have been. Yeah. But, you know, they're good against the run. Um, I think Valdosta is good enough with the passing game. So I'm going to take the Blazers here. Okay. Uh, Chris. Yeah, I don't know, guys. Uh, you know, <laughs> West Florida is the team that, right, you know, we look at the last two weeks, and that's a very short uh, sample. But they've been kind of up, kind of down. And, you know, West Alabama uh, typically has a pretty strong defense. And I don't really know. It, it, this one feels like it might be a little bit of a track meet to me. And and that's because I seem like that also seems to, to allow that to kind of happen. And if they could in a track meet, I'm not sure they're going to keep up West Florida uh, in, in something like this. So I, I'm going to go with the Argos on this one. Okay. And Justin? Unfortunately, Chris, I think you're right. And, and really, unfortunately, Chuck and, and Witt, I, I think you are are wrong. So. <laughs> we'll revisit this in a week. I'm going to know I'll say it. You're wrong. <laughs> West Florida at home, baby. Chuck, don't take that from me. All right. Uh Tony? Yeah, guys, I, I'm, I just West Florida is one of those teams where you'd like you'd like them to like have an identity, and you just can't quite figure out what it is. Um, and yet, at the same time, when I look at Valdosta, I mean, to me, the only real team they've played is Delta. I mean, you look at some of the teams that they've beaten. I mean, even North Greenville, we're talking about tonight. What a disappointment that they've been. Um, I, I, something tells me that if, if it, this does end up being a little bit of a, an up and down type of game, and I think that favors the Argos. 
I am now starting my assignments in a 10 point deficit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon, who, who you got? I got the Blazers. Okay. I think that, uh, I just think that West Florida has been inconsistent. And, uh, and I think, uh, that's it's a, it's just a gut feeling. I have no data or anything to uh, back me up. I just think they're going to do that. All right, uh, Wit. I'm going to skip you since this is a Northern Sun game. Yeah, well, I get start. the answer, so get everybody else first. All right, uh, Chris. Uh, Bemidji State, Minnesota Duluth. Well, you know this game features two uh, outstanding quarterbacks. Uh, in the uh, Northern Sun, in the Wall Jasper for Duluth and, and Bemidji and Alt. Ooh, this could end up being a lot of offense uh, as well. Uh, I kind of wonder, um, you know, is uh, Duluth going to have enough to keep up with Bemidji? Uh, and uh, is Bemidji going to have a lot of turnovers? Because uh, that seems to have doomed them in the past. In, in this one, um, I, I, I'm going to go with a safer bet. I'm going to go with Bemidji in this one. Justin. So I really have no judge on this at all. So I'm, I just want to confirm that Minnesota Duluth is the Bulldogs and Bemidji State's the Beavers, right? That is correct. I just yes, want to make sure. There'll be a quiz on this later. Okay, well, because here's what I'm saying. I, I've, I have Bulldogs. And, and, yeah, you don't want to mess with a Bulldog. But, damn, I never seen a Beaver you want to mess with. So for that reason, I'm taking the damn Beavers. <laughs> Interesting. Now, how I'll we mess you there. up now. You see those teeth? Come on now. Congrats, I just, congrats. Hey, 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 Justin, the best gas station in the country is Bucky's. It's a beaver. It's a beaver. Yeah. You're dang right. Yeah. <laughs> Justin, congratulations on the new low of using I like green uniforms better than red uniforms logic. Yeah. Uh, hey. I, I'm that, embarrassed was a, that was a good housewife pick, yes. I'm, I'm embarrassed for us all. All right, Tony. You... <laughs> I'm embarrassed for us all anyway, but I keep showing up here anyway. I don't know what that, what's that, what's that say about me. Uh, I think, uh, I think the close loss to Mankato a couple weeks ago has kind of got Bemidji on the right track here for the, what they've got on the left on their docket. I, I like, the, I like Bemidji in this one. All right. Uh, I am going to take the Beavers as well. Um, I think that they will be able to slow down, run game enough to uh, come away with a, a victory. Uh, Chuck. Yeah, I, I view this as a toss up. I think both teams are very, very good. I do think Bemidji's defense is a bit underrated. Um, you know, Duluth, they're, they're a really good team. I think that they need to be able to do a little bit more than just hammer at you with Wall Jasper. I think if they can't bring a little bit more than that to the table, I think it plays into Bemidji's hands defensively. So I'm going to go with the Beavers. Okay. Wit. You have well, the, key, the, to the is, key to the test. Yeah, the, the, the Get truth the is, is that... Uh... Duluth has the, the number one defense in the, in the Northern Sun. They get to the quarterback a whole bunch, uh, and they have a quarterback who is like tackling a linebacker. However, Bemidji can both run and throw, and they are right there as like the 1B for the top defense in the Northern Sun, and they also can get to the quarterback. And like Chuck mentioned, I think the fact that Bemidji's a little bit more multiple uh, and I think they're a little more battle tested so far. Uh, I, I like the Beavers here as well. So apparently we've all taken them, which is once again the kiss of death. All right, and our final game, the game of the week. So, so, uh, hold on one second, Brandon. I'm sorry. Yeah. So you can go with Wit's logic of the stats, or you can go with my logic that the mascot is <laughs> fearful. Either way, yes. we get to the same damn spot. You know what yes. I mean? Yes. <laughs> Just for the I believe that's known as a distinction without a difference. You know, <laughs> causation, <laughs> causation and correlation. You know, we, we can get we can get the same spot by going a mile east or twenty five thousand miles west and coming back to that same spot. All right, one is one is a better uh, choice. All right, let's, let's let's go with the game of the week, and we're gonna let Chuck pick last as the national columnist. Western Colorado is at Colorado Mine, so Matt, get us started. I've been watching plenty of both of these teams on the RMAC app. And, uh, you know, Colorado Mines has been exceptional. And they haven't had, you know, a, a real good tester. I mean, they were down at half this week, but then just totally, you know, blew away Black Hills the second half. Um, Western Colorado has been very impressive to me. They've had very good quarterback play. 
Um, you know, and then they've also they got a running back I like, and I like the way they play defense. I got Western Colorado on the upset this week. Huh? You heard Fantastic. it right. Fantastic, Chris. Man, oh gosh! I'm bringing the heat right away for. I'm telling you, my goodness. The last time that Western beat Mines was 2016. So that's a that's a pretty long streak as is. And you look at kind of what Mines has. I mean, it's been a machine here. Yeah. And then every time we doubt Western, Western makes a fool of us. So well, I don't. They're not huh? the only one. I, the only right. One. That's true. That's very true. <laughs> but I don't know if I could take the risk of choosing Western in this game. I think Mines might just be a little too much. So I'm going to go with Colorado Mines. Hey, hey, Chris, how'd that, uh, how'd that fear of the risk work out in your uh, CIAA prediction? Oh my gosh! Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Bowie State, right? I mean, good grief! No, 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 no. <laughs> well, I meant Elizabeth City. You said you thought. Oh, that one too. Yeah, that yeah. was even. But that was a greater risk than this one. I mean, <laughs> I kind of at least thought about choosing Western. <laughs> All right, uh, Justin, please. To be the best, you got to beat the best, and and right now, you, you, there's still a little bit to prove. I think for Western Colorado, I'm not saying they can't do it, but uh, I think Colorado mines at home. All right, uh, Tony. Yeah, until I see it, you know, and maybe they're going to prove us all wrong, but it's hard for me to pick against Mines. Yep, you know, Mines, uh, for the first time in program history, really looks like they got a real chance to be the national champion. And I don't know if that uh, uh, if that changes after this week, but I, I'm, I'm going to go with them because I believe they might be the best team this year. Uh, Chuck, please uh, round it out for us. Well, I must be spending too much time talking to Wit throughout the week. Um, I, I know, I know, I'm. Spending no one ever says that, Chuck. What are you throughout talking the week, about? And, except and, for people whose number you have. <laughs> maybe, maybe, uh, maybe we just talked ourselves into this, but I'm actually going Western Colorado in an upset here yeah. as well. And it really, it doesn't have anything to do with Colorado Mines. I, I still think very highly of them. I voted them number one the last couple of weeks. I think that they are an exceptional team. This just feels like a spot where, you know, a streak is ready to come to an end. And, and I'm picking this almost more just on a feel kind of like you look at those matchups in the NCAA tournament, like your fives and twelves and, um, you know, tens and sevens. And you kind of pick your spots, not even looking so much at the teams. I think this Western Colorado team is sneaky good. Um, we know what they can do defensively. I've been very impressed with what they've been able to do offensively this year. It's still a huge, huge task to go into to Golden and beat them, but I, I think Western Colorado can win this game. Very good, Chuck. All right, at least uh, at least it's not a bunch of uh, teams being picked by everybody, so it's a little bit more fun this week. Yep. All right, folks, uh, let's go ahead and uh, remind you to follow us on Facebook, YouTube, uh, Twitter. You're probably watching us on one of those uh, right now. Uh, any social media, if you search for D, at D2 Football, you're going to find us. Uh, during the week, these columnists and podcasters break down what's going on in their conferences. Uh, do a fine job of doing that. Please give that a look. And please share um, this show. Please share our content. And tell your friends about us if, if you think they would be interested in, in Division Two and specific conference or whatever. Tell them about us because, you know, you are our marketing team. It's not like we've got a, a tremendous a large budget to go out and market ourselves. So we appreciate the word of mouth being spread by uh, you folks. And, of course, remember on game days, you can uh, check out scores on D2Football.com. We're in, the, we're in the home stretch, and Super Region scores will be more important now than they uh, have been all year. But you can also sort by top 25 or by conference. If you are interested in that, uh, a reminder to visit pinkclover.org if you would like to uh, support that organization. And again, want to thank Boss's Pizza and Chicken for being a sponsor of Inside D2 Football. We're going to go backstage for a minute so we can flag some questions. There is no need to switch the stream this week. Uh, we will be right back in a minute or two, and we will start the overtime uh, when we come back. 